basically all I can tell you about Wakefield is what's written is what's mostly written is and the interpretations pretty much out so far is how about that? I love that. I don't know about you, but reaching 10,000 steps always sounds easier than it really is. I often wonder, why 10,000? What is it about that number? Are there actually specific health benefits to it, or has someone simply pulled it out of, well, you know where? But none of that really matters. While on your 10,000 step crusade, have you ever really wondered where those steps are taking you? If isolation has taught us anything, it is the value of walking and running. I mean, everyone is out doing it. But while out on your expeditions, do you ever think about the people whose footsteps you may be tracing? So, here we are, up north, the site of our next battle. Welcome to Wakefield. Now, when it comes to Wakefield, we're all gonna have to work that much harder. Why? Because no matter what anyone says, we really know very little about what actually happened here. So, lend me your imagination, switch on those BS detectors, and let's get started. Right here at the gatehouse to Sandal Castle. There are four main theories surrounding the Battle of Wakefield. These were concocted by historians based on the information we do have. Why are there four, do you ask? Well, that's because getting historians to agree is like the social media platforms deciding on which one is best. It's just never gonna happen. But what we can be certain of is that the written word and social media platforms, they are both great sources for fake news. The story goes that here on the 30th of December, 1460, Richard Duke of York marched his army of Yorkists out of these very gates here at Sandal Castle into the field beyond at Wakefield to engage a somewhat larger Lancastrian force. They marched down many gates lane before being close enough to charge. Once the armies had engaged, it is believed the Yorkists were outnumbered and massacred as more Lancastrian troops broke from the cover of trees and stormed into the Yorkist flanks. Richard was captured, while his second son Edmund and Salisbury got all the way to Wakefield Bridge before Edmund is killed in the fighting and Salisbury taken prisoner. What we don't know is why Richard, Duke of York, came out of the castle in the first place to face his most mortal enemy, Queen Margaret of Anjou. So, let's look at theory number one, Instagram. I'm just uploading my selfie as we speak. Now that's fake news, folks, because as you can see, I ain't scouting nothing. We're shooting, but to everyone who sees this post, how are they to know what I don't tell them? York would have arrived here at Sandal Castle roughly six days before the battle. From the keep, you could see for miles around, and he would have had roughly one third of the Yorkist army with him, so between three and 4,000 men. Should we go have a look? It is the middle of winter, and they are deep within enemy territory. Lancastrian territory. I've got a spider on my fingers. It is the middle of winter, and they are in the heart of enemy territory. Lancastrian territory. Theory 1 suggests that York sends out a foraging party to either gather supplies or scout the Lancastrian position. It is suggested that this party is then attacked by the Lancastrian vanguard who are lying in wait. It is at this point that Richard, seeing his men being attacked, charges his army out to support them. When the true extent of the Lancastrian force 
makes themselves known by coming out and flanking the Yorkist line. Now let me ask you one simple question. Do you think that Richard, Duke of York, who was now heir to the throne of England, would have sent his entire force out of the protection of this castle just for the sake of a foraging party? As you can see, this is why the likes of Mike Ingram consider this theory to be However, if York is only seeing one side of the story, see what I did there, you could understand why he might have misinterpreted the size of the Lancastrian force. For if he sees his men running away from a somewhat smaller force, he might believe that he could get out there and overcome the enemy before reinforcements arrive, even though he knows there are more Lancastrians in the vicinity. You see, Instagram is often only one side of the story. Now this brings me on to theory number two, Twitter. Dun, dun, dun. The power of the provoke. Now, trolls and keyboard warriors are a thing, and let's be honest, we're all probably guilty of it in some form or another. And that's because it's much easier to say things with the protection of a screen rather than face to face. But theory number two suggests that the Duke of York was provoked into coming out of the castle. Some say that Queen Margaret slipped into the DMs of Richard Duke of York, telling him he was a coward and a chicken for not coming out and facing her like a man. Now, Richard Duke of York had recently become the heir to the English throne through the Act of Accord, and well, he was a very seasoned commander. Somehow, I really don't believe he would have succumbed to such base level tactics. I think it is also worth mentioning that it is highly unlikely the Yorkists would have had their army inside the castle walls. I mean, look around me. This is it. This is Sandal Castle. It's tiny. There is no way they would have had 4,000 men and their horses within these castle walls. It is much more likely that they would have had them camped outside. But if this is the case, we have to look back to Ludford Bridge and Northampton. Both had fortified encampments and added to the fact that the Yorkists were deep inside Lancastrian territory, it makes sense that they would fortify their position outside of the castle walls. But if that is the case, why would the Duke of York give that up so easily? Why would he throw away such an advantage? Oi, who you been texting? Oi, give that back! Shut up and sit down. That's the last time I'm ever using TikTok. Now, theory three, ambush. Some people believe that Richard was baited out of the castle by a smaller Lancastrian force. Now, whether he was misinformed as to the true extent of the Lancastrian army, or whether he just believed he could overcome a smaller part of it before reinforcements could arrive, he sallies out and engages the enemy. However, the bulk of the Lancastrian army are hidden within the trees and once he's engaged their centre, they come crashing out into his flanks, surrounding him, engulfing the army, and capturing him in the fighting. This memorial stands here in his honour. Now this theory is actually highly probable. However, there is one little snag, and that is we do not actually know if there would have been trees on this location at the time of the battle. What we do know is that one source does mention or talk about certain coverings for the Lancastrian forces. What it says is that York's force was environed on all sides. Now that could mean trees. It has in fact been interpreted as meaning trees since, but it doesn't actually say it. So can it be believed? I am now standing at Wakefield Bridge. This is where Edmund, York's son, managed to retreat to along with Salisbury before they were finally caught up with by the Lancastrians. Edmund was killed in the fighting by Baron Clifford, whose father had been killed at the First Battle of St Albans five years earlier. For murdering Edmund, he would hereby be remembered as Butcher Clifford. It is said that this chapel was endowed by King Edward IV years later, in his brother's memory.
Ah. I've just had a friend request from one Butcher Clifford. That's a little bit freaky. But it does bring me on to theory four, the deceiver of all deceivers. Facebook. It is also often argued that York was deceived by the Earl of Westmoreland, who was Salisbury's half-brother. It is said that he approached the gates claiming he wanted to switch sides. When York marched his army out to meet him, the Lancastrians launched their assault. It is unlikely that if Westmoreland had attempted such a ruse, that Richard would have actually fallen for it. After all, it was well known that Westmoreland hated Salisbury because Salisbury had inherited all of their father's lands, leaving Westmoreland with nothing. But for argument's sake, let's imagine Richard did believe that Westmoreland wanted to switch sides. Do you honestly think he would have marched his entire army out to meet him? Probably not. Fake news is everywhere these days, just as much as it was then. Without digging up the housing estate that sits upon the battlefield site today, it is unlikely we will ever really know the truth. However, the truth probably lies somewhere in the mix with all of them. So here we have it our Battle of Wakefield. We have Sandal Castle here and Wakefield Bridge here to the north. Then we have the Yorkist forces along with Richard, Duke of York, sallying out of the castle walls to face Margaret of Anjou and what he perceives to be the bulk of the Lancastrian army. And then on the sides, we have the two hidden armies ready to lay their ambush. Now, it is believed that there are four main theories about the Battle of Wakefield. But actually, there are five, and this is because Mike Ingram and I have a theory of our own. We believe the most likely option is going to be theory one, but with some changes. The main point that remains a stickler is that Edmund and Salisbury were caught at Wakefield Bridge. It has been believed that they were fleeing from the battle. However, Wakefield Bridge is to the north of Sandal Castle and further into Lancastrian territory. It just doesn't make sense that they would be retreating this way. Unless they were a part of a foraging or scouting party sent out by Richard Duke of York on the morning of the 30th of December. Now, one source does suggest that they were captured and killed before the battle actually started. Now, if this is the case, it does make sense why Richard Duke of York comes out of the castle because Midlam, Salisbury's stronghold, is only 60 miles north through Lancastrian territory. Perhaps they were heading north to the bridge to go to Midlam to gather reinforcements. Now, it is at this point that they may have run into the Lancastrian vanguard, been surrounded, cut off and attacked. Or they could have got across the bridge and met Lancastrians on the other side of the bridge, hence why other sources talk about them retreating across the bridge because actually they're heading back to Sandal Castle rather than in the other direction. But it is at this point that Richard Duke of York from his castle walls sees men fleeing from their party back towards the castle. Knowing his son and father-in-law are likely to be in danger, it answers the question as to why he gathers his men and sallies them out of the protection of the castle to engage the enemy. Why? Because in fact, He's launching a rescue mission. Nevertheless, the Yorkists are defeated. Margaret finally gets hold of Richard and Salisbury and Richard is executed. <laughs> According to a contemporary source, it is said he was executed on top of a little anthill with a crown of wreaths on his head. It was over a hundred years later that the account emerged that Margaret placed a paper crown on his head and stuck it on a spike on the gates of York. But finally, Margaret has made heads roll. Social media is not always fake news. Today, in museums like this one in Wakefield, they use their social media to bring local finds to your very own handheld devices. Now, this medieval spearhead was found in Wakefield at the battlefield site and dated to 1460. And it's being brought to you by my favorite social media platform, YouTube. Today is an awesome day and we here at Swiping Through History are so excited because for the first time we have the chance to get our hands on a real medieval object, this medieval spearhead. Thank you so much, John, for giving us this opportunity and I'm just so excited. I can't even talk properly. Oh, 
Let's go. Look at that. So this is 555 years old. Wow. Thank you so much. This is a slice of history right here. But the question is, which side was this spear on? Do you think it was a Yorkist spear or a Lancastrian spear? Now that is the question. Wow. Thank you.